Well, welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight, and let's talk about atrial fibrillation, something that I've been involved with over the last 15 years or so, and uh, hopefully this presentation will help you learn a little more about, a little bit more about atrial fibrillation. We will talk about treatment, and uh, then I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. If you're going through the presentation, a question comes up that pertains to the topic, then just raise your hand, and I'll try to address that question. <coughs> so uh, over the next half an hour or so, uh, we'll talk about what atrial fibrillation is, what we mean but when we say rate versus rhythm control, w how common this arrhythmia is, what type of treatments available, whether with regards to drugs therapy or ablation procedure, um, how safe and effective these procedures are, and then briefly we will talk about that what are the alternatives to blood thinners uh, which are commonly instituted for a majority of patients with atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia. It affects uh, older population, and as the population is aging, we are uh, seeing a more and more number of people who are affected by this arrhythmia. Currently, there are about 5 million people with atrial fibrillation in the U.S., and this uh, number is, by estimation, going to go up to 12 million by year 2050. So basically the message is it's very common arrhythmia and it affects as we age. What are the risk factors? Some of the common risk factors associated with arrhythmia are being overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, and other sorts of cardiovascular diseases. Again, some of the diseases which are common uh, with the aging. And what does atrial fibrillation do? Its negative impact on quality of life is well recognized, and it is the leading cause of stroke. It increases your stroke risk five times depending on what other risk factors are. Also, it is associated with heart failure. It can cause diastolic heart failure, which basically means that your heart muscle function, when we check it, looks fine, but heart is unable to relax properly. And when atrial fibrillation hits, the heart rate gets faster, the heart gets less time to relax, and even though the heart muscle function looks good, in fact, you begin to feel symptoms that are consistent with heart failure. And it is costing significant to the health system, as you see, about 12 million estimated costs to treat atrial fibrillation. So just looking at the electrical system of the heart, to my right is what the normal electrical system of the heart is. There's a ticker of the heart called sinus node. Electrical impulse arises there, and it travels through some discrete pathways to get to the lower chamber. Atrial fibrillation, of course, comes from the upper chamber, and they are called atria. In atrial fibrillation, what happens is that the upper chambers are now beating abnormally and very rapid. The heart rate in the upper chamber, in some instances, can be as fast as 350 beats per minute. But most of these impulses do not get through to the lower chamber because there is what we call an AV node, which blocks off most of these impulses. So your heart rate is a function of how many of those impulses go through. In some people, it can be as high as 200 beats per minute. In other people, it can still be within normal range from somewhere between 60 to 100 beats per minute, again, depending on how fast it gets through that AV node. Atrial fibrillation, you will hear different patterns of it. So roughly, we divide it into sort of three different forms. Paroxysmal is the one in which the heart rhythm corrects itself. You go into atrial fibrillation, and then you go back to normal rhythm on your own. This is the most common form of arrhythmia. And usually, we use one week as a definition. If your arrhythmia lasts more than one week and doesn't self-correct, then it's more a persistent pattern than paroxysmal pattern. And in persistent pattern, the arrhythmia occurs, lasts over a week, and sometimes doesn't self-correct. 
And in persistent form of atrial fibrillation, actually even shock treatment doesn't work and you are uh, in persistent arrhythmia which cannot be corrected with the shock even though there are other treatments available. I'm just going to see what's, uh, well, there it's up again. Um, so what causes atrial fibrillation? As we talked about age, as we age above the age of 60, just being getting older is one of the reasons why atrial fibrillation becomes more frequent. High blood pressure, structural heart disease, increasing body weight, and in some people, particularly the younger population, people who are involved in intense long-distance um, sports, basketball, running, marathon runner, triathletes, unfortunately, they tend to also get a higher risk of atrial fibrillation. There's some degree of genetic factors, although the genetics of the arrhythmia are not yet panned out, but in some families where it occurs in clusters, particularly at a younger age, genetics may have a role to play, and alcohol is a common trigger of arrhythmia. How much alcohol? It depends. It can be very little alcohol in some people, and in uh, others, we, what we do now is that at some point, you drink enough, you will be in atrial fibrillation. But some people are exclusively sensitive to atrial fibrillation. And if you do find a relationship with a certain amount, that would be where essentially you would be. So what are the signs and symptoms? Uh, shortness of breath is a common symptom. Uh, most people will feel some degree of racing heart. You will call it fluttering in the chest, palpitations. Um, and some people can get dizzy or lightheaded. And one of the most common symptoms which gets unrecognized is fatigue. As the arrhythmia affects mostly people as we age, I see many of my patients who would say, you know, Doc, I'm just getting older. Well, you didn't get older in the last six months. It's, it's fatigue is a common symptom and often underreported. But people would often, you know, attribute it to their age or some other factor which is going on. Um, and there are some people, there's no discernible symptom. Uh, first time it is discovered when they went for a pre-op, they had an EKG done, and they were told you're in atrial fibrillation. And interestingly, once that is treated, then they recognize that, you know, I was kind of slowed down, going up hills was becoming a little harder, but no direct symptoms of sort of great magnitude which would have alerted them that something is going on. Um, again, why does AFib matter? We talked about it and just repeating again. It can cause blood clots. Those blood clots can cause stroke and in associated with heart failure in uh, a number of patients. And in majority of the patient, it has some degree of impact on uh, quality of life over time. So what are the treatment options? Uh, as usually with most disease processes, there are medication, which can either control your heart rate or rhythm. Uh, surgical approaches, pacemaker and defibrillators have some role, although not directly. And restoration of normal rhythm through electrical cardioversion, which is a temporary measure in which your heart's shocked back to normal rhythm, and then medications are used to facilitate normal rhythm. And then radio frequency or cryoablation to eliminate triggers and other uh, factors which are built into the atrial tissue that perpetuate atrial fibrillation. So let's talk about some of these treatment options. The Sentinel trial, which was performed in early 2000, uh, started somewhere in late 90s and sort of reported in 2000. Back then, the ablative strategies for atrial fibrillation were really still not mature. There were, there were some centers which were uh, sort of doing that, but majority of the patients were managed with medication. And the two strategies that we have, we used to call it rate control and rhythm control. Rate control meant we left you in atrial fibrillation, we put you on medication so that your heart didn't race, but your rhythm did not change. 
The rhythm control, on the other hand, was where we used medication and shock treatment, cardioversion as we talked about, to restore normal rhythm and then maintain normal rhythm. So in this study, uh, which was uh, conducted from 96 to 2002, it reported then, it showed that overall there was no difference in mortality meaning that the number of patients who died in either arm of the study was no different. And in fact, patients in quote-unquote rhythm control, where the attempts were made to maintain normal rhythm, had more strokes. So this meant that for a while, the treatment was that if you don't feel greatly limited by your arrhythmia, let's just rate control you and put you on blood thinners. The reason why more people suffered stroke in that study was that you came in, you had a shock, you went back to normal rhythm, and your doctor felt, okay, you know, it feels like you're in normal rhythm now, so we can stop your blood thinners. Turns out that wasn't such a great idea, because even though you may have been in normal rhythm during some follow-ups, you may have had periods of atrial fibrillation at other times. However, there was some st startling uh, data that came out of this study. And if you look at the two highlighted bars, it says that if you were on a heart rhythm drug, your likelihood of dying was 50% higher. But if you could be in normal rhythm, you were likely to do better, in fact, so much better that your mortality improved by 50%. So that alerted us to something, that the heart rhythm drug, if used indiscriminately, in fact, may not be a great idea. You had to select patients properly for the right antirhythmic drug. And if somehow we could get to normal rhythm without use of heart rhythm drug, that would be ideal, because in fact, it had potential to improve your mortality. <laughs> Again, the same thing. If you were sinus rhythm associated with 50% decreased mortality risk, and heart rhythm drug alone, if used indiscriminately, it could in fact increase your mortality. As we talked about, atrial fibrillation is increasingly common as the population ages, but only 10% of the people end up getting uh, a definitive treatment for it. And the reason being that most of the patients are deemed asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. And by the time they get to the treatment, they may be, the disease may have been uh, too far advanced. And in majority of the patients, number of drugs are used. And by the time they make the cut for a more definitive treatment, their disease has advanced. Uh, currently, there is a guideline that we use. It's called a Heart Rhythm Society's Consensus Statement, and majority of the cardiology society involved in this says that if you have symptomatic atrial fibrillation, particularly paroxysmal that was used in these guidelines, and you have one drug, either class one or class three, there are two types of heart rhythm drugs, is this, it is the time to talk to your doctor about an ablation. So, if, if many of you may have been exposed to some of these drugs, we use rate-controlling drugs, and they are often called beta blocker or calcium blockers. Some of the names are metoprolol, propranolol, atenolol. In calcium blockers, frequently used drug is diltiazem. And in some people, although with decreasing um, uh, frequency, we use a medication called digoxin. The heart rhythm drugs are classified based on how they work on the channel system that they work with. And the most commonly used drug are flaconide, propafenone, which belong to class 1C, or class 3 drugs, amiodarone, sotalol, or deferolide. Again, your doctor gets to choose these drugs based on a number of different variables. How is your renal function? What is the structure of your heart like? Do you have a cardiomyopathy? Do you have heart failure? Do you have any liver issues? Because uh, some of these drugs are contraindicated in some subset and the others in uh, other patients. So what, when we talk about atrial fibrillation, the ablation procedure that targets triggers for atrial fibrillation, if you research it, it would come out and you will often hear pulmonary vein isolation. 
pulmonary vein isolation is the exact procedure that we do for patients who have paroxysmal or self-correcting atrial fibrillation. It is now widely accepted as the cornerstone of atrial fibrillation procedures. Electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins is recommended during all AFib procedures. The cartoon that you see, which is a, a, a white diagram of left atrium or left upper chamber, if you look at the back of the heart, if, I, if you were to look at me from here and the, my left atrium, that's what it would look like, back wall with the four veins coming in. The heart is all electrically innervated from inside, but some of these membranes extend into these veins. And when they extend into these veins, the cells there, which are electrically active, tend to behave abnormally and end up producing triggers for atrial fibrillation. So what we do in this procedure is that we go and put a catheter up in these veins, identify that the electrical triggers exist there, and then either using radiofrequency or cryoablation, eliminate those triggers, creating a line of electrical scar around the veins as they enter into the heart, thus eliminating these triggers. And majority of the patients who have self-correcting form of atrial fibrillation do quite well with this procedure. Here's a diagram of what actually are different modalities that we use. On the right side of the screen is a cryo balloon. It shows that it's entering into the vein with the catheter coming out of it. And on the other side is radio frequency, which is the old burning method. And they vary from institution to institution. We commonly use uh, cryoablation because the balloon is designed to target pulmonary veins, and it has shortened the duration of the procedure, the morbidity associated with the procedure, and uh, we do close to uh, 500 procedure a year using cryoballoon for pulmonary vein isolation. So they looked at the different trials, both with cryo and radio frequency. Both modality offered very similar relief. On the left side is um, radiofrequency ablation. At the end of the year, compared to medication, which was only 16% effective, radiofrequency ablation was effective 66% of the time. In cryoablation, it was around 70%. And this was very strict follow-up of patients, frequent monitoring, whether or not they had symptoms. We knew whether or not they were in atrial fibrillation. Um, Oh, there was some data, although with a bit of a caveat that we do not stop blood thinners just because we feel your ablation was effective. A number of other factors are considered in making a decision whether you should indefinitely continue with the blood thinners. And it has really, it has to be a very individualized decision. But in the studies, it was shown that if you had an effective ablation, and elimination of your atrial fibrillation, it might in fact favor lower <coughs> stroke risk. Um, the other positive aspect of ablation was that it was associated with reduced rate of progression when compared to drugs. So if you looked at over time, over four years, fewer people had recurrences if they had ablation compared to if they were left on drugs. What do you mean by progression? So, uh, for example, you have atrial fibrillation and your doctor prescribed a medication for you. And you do well for six months, then you had one or two incidences. If we left you on medication at that point, over the next three years, your likelihood of having more incidence of atrial fibrillation or progression to a persistent form of arrhythmia would be higher compared to if you had an ablation. Uh, How bad do you mean by that? Can you go to 160, 200, pass out, or? Oh, you mean how, what is the, so symptoms vary, with, uh, more dramatic symptoms you have, 
more the negative impact of arrhythmia would be on your quality of life. You can have one person sitting next to you, you have, he's in it, he or she is in atrial fibrillation, but don't know about it until they take a walk and get short of breath. In your case, you go in and out of atrial fibrillation, and that causes you to pass out. Clearly, you have more dramatic symptoms, and that can vary dramatically from individual to individual. If you don't know it, then it means that you don't have associated symptoms with it. Then there are different ways to monitor you, and some of those monitoring can be performed with tiny chips inserted under your skin, which can monitor you for that recurrence. But then at that point, if you didn't know, it means that on majority of the occasion, you are not directly aware of when your arrhythmia is coming and going, and it happens. And that's maybe the reason why people who were deemed cured still had strokes, because they may not know when they were going in and out. Um, the other important aspect of this was that if you are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and we do not effectively and early treat the disease, the likelihood that the disease would progress to a more refractory or advanced form is higher if um, ablation is performed late. And the reason for that is that if your atrial fibrillation continues, it in fact makes structural changes to your upper chamber. The upper chamber can dilate and the electrical activity within them can change to a more heterogeneous pattern which can become more difficult to treat. Yes? I'm sorry, I have to ask a stupid question because I don't understand what ablation means. If I don't understand, and I, I will not follow. Or right, as I was ablation talking is about. Ablation something, right? Ablation is a procedure in which we put a catheter up in the heart and eliminate the abnormal triggers by either freezing or burning them through a catheter-based procedure. That's called an ablation. Okay. The literal word ablation means destroying abnormal tissue which means that in cancer patients, you do that with radiation. In the case of heart ablation, we are basically saying that we can eliminate abnormal circuits by either freezing or burning them. And is that one time thing, that the tube is not permanently sticking into your heart? No, this is, the procedure is performed using the catheter, which are then removed. If you had an opportunity, take a look on the back table. I brought some catheters. They're inserted into the body and then removed. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, you're saying the word ablation. How many ablations can you actually have? <laughs> so, um, so if you look at the data for atrial fibrillation, you will often hear that it worked second time around because 30% of the people may get some degree of recurrence. Unlike other arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation is a little different. So the number of ablation is not what dictates how many can you have. If you had atrial fibrillation, you had an ablation in 2010, and then you did well until 2018, you got another ablation, and then you ended up with some sort of flutter. I have had patients who have had six, seven, eight procedures because the nature of the arrhythmia circuits that recurred changed. So now we have the ability to go in and sort of map out these circuits on our, with three-dimensional computerized system, which allow us to know exactly where these abnormal impulses are. So ablation by itself doesn't dictate. I think in terms of probably the best way to understand is that if you have coronary artery disease, in which means that there's narrowing of the arteries of the heart, we often don't ask how many stents can you have because anytime you have narrowing, your doctor may choose that either to treat it with medication or go in and open up that narrowing. Even though the concept here is very different, the disease itself, because it progresses over time, renders itself quite well to procedures over time which can allow you to maintain a good quality of life, number of procedures not dictating. You're, if you had five ablation that you're still having arrhythmia, it, it would be a unique situation in which your doctor will have to make a decision whether or not there's any benefit to putting you through more procedures or not. Well, what's the success rate for the first time you have it? Remember, you said 30 percent? So if you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and your left atrium is electrically normal and your hypertension or weight or everything else is adequately treated, then pulmonary vein isolation should give you 
80% chance of arith being arrhythmia free for at least five years. Now again, if your left atrium is dilated, if your arrhythmia is persistent, or if your paroxysmal arrhythmia was electrically coupled by an abnormal electrical structure of the atrium, this number would not hold. So it really depends on your individual case. But for a healthy heart, where atrial fibrillation is purely triggered arrhythmia, you should expect that much from uh, current ablation procedure. Um, Something else has to be done. So again, that was the question we were addressing. It, many a times, it comes down to the choice of what you feel about continuing with the medication versus having an ablation. Because, you know, you're sort of it's pros and cons. You're taking some risk up front versus drug risk is more over time. With procedure, more risk is more acute. The issue with atrial fibrillation is if you wait for the medications to fail, the same procedure, which like this gentleman asked about, how efficacious is this? If its efficacy earlier was 80%, it won't be if you delay to the point where the drugs failed. Because when the medications fail, your disease has progressed. Now we will talk briefly about there are other approaches, but you will need a lot bigger ablation compared to pulmonary vein isolation, which is a very clean, sort of a limited ablation for atrial fibrillation. Um, this is just briefly to show you that, uh, uh, rather than going into details, that this was a large study conducted, it's called Fire and Ice. They compared radio frequency with uh, uh, cryoablation and had to had as should be expected, they were about the same. So you will see different institutions preferring one technique versus the other. But in, 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 in our institution, we favor cryo. I, patient's morbidity is less. You get faster, less chest pain. So I think there are certainly favorable aspects to it. And again, this is uh, some favorable data with cryoablation is that relative to radio frequency, fewer people got admitted after the procedure and fewer people needed repeat ablations. Um, and again, this is another study in which they looked at a large number of patients and both radio frequency and cryo balloon ablations provided better long-term outcomes compared to drug therapy. Uh, and this is one of the questions that you asked. So if they look at, so these are all different studies that are tallied up, looking at different numbers at different institutions, ranging anywhere from 50 to 300 patients. And if you look at it, average number comes out with the single procedure at around 80%. Um, and again, the, the technology has really helped that advance this procedure into a shorter ablation procedure, which creates less morbidity for the patients and is more effective. Um, in my procedure, that, and majority of our operators here, we do not even inject contrast. Radiation, the exposure to you during the procedure is more often or not similar to what you will have during a chest x-ray. And we use three-dimensional computer mapping we use intracardiac echocardiogram in which a catheter makes pictures of the heart as we are delivering ablation. And uh, we can monitor the pressures from the very sheets we use to determine the efficacy of our ablation lesions. And, you know, moving on to the next step, if you were to tell me I had a pulmonary vein isolation, it didn't work for me. What are the options for me now? A few years ago, we could have said really not much, but I can tell you, you do have options now. The catheter ablation, computer technology assisting us trying to find other targets beyond pulmonary vein isolation have enabled us to improve outcomes even in patients in whom pulmonary vein isolation did not work. So as we talked about, 
looking at the upper chamber of the heart, majority of the people, when they have atrial fibrillation, first ablation around, they will have pulmonary vein isolation, which is on the left side of the screen. You see the full pulmonary veins with, with ablation lesions around there. And often we combine it, what we call common flutter ablation on the right. But this is what most people will get done if you had a self-correcting form of atrial fibrillation. Here, um, and I know that we do offer more individualized approach if pulmonary vein isolation did not work. What does that mean? We talked about that majority of the people have atrial fibrillation because the triggers come from pulmonary veins. How about those in whom pulmonary vein isolation did not work? There may be non-pulmonary vein triggers. We look for them. Defining distribution and extent of the fibrosis. What does that mean? We go in and use specialized catheters to map out the electrical health of your upper chambers. How much electrical scarring is there? We call that fibrosis. And if you have a certain fibrosis, we can tell you in your case, you might have to take a medication long term because ablation alone would not be very effective because you already have sort of auto-ablated, which is fibrosis or existing electrical scar. And then we have novel mapping techniques, which are amazing way to look at non-pulmonary vein rotor-based changes in your atria, which we can now detect with these advanced mapping, mapping system. This is something we started here oh, three, four years ago, in which there's a special catheter which identifies areas within the body of the electrical tissue of the atrium and identify, for the lack of better term, almost electrical storms going on, very similar to weather pattern. We can look at where those quote-unquote rotors are. Like, you know, in, in those uh, weather reports, they say there is a tornado moving in this area. Here it would come and here it would stop. We can reproduce the electrical pattern, put them into a computer, which can then allow us to understand how these areas are behaving and then target those zones which may end up restoring you to normal rhythm. This takes a little more beyond the normal pulmonary vein isolation procedure, but allows us to treat those areas. We'll talk about that in a second, but it, it's in some people, yes. And in others, in whom the disease has already advanced to a higher level, we institute it at, at the first procedure. So uh, how does that work? If, if you were to look at this weather pattern, you will say, okay, you know, where is actually the eye of the storm? Is this organized here, here? Where is the actual... You look at the electrical health of your, the atrium, and you can't always s detect what area should I target. You don't want to target the whole atrium. You want to target a certain area. If you're too close, the image is not clear. If you back off a little bit, you can begin to see how this map of this area looks like. Um, if we measure the electrical activity within the body of the atrium, it looks like certain electrogram, but doesn't tell us whether we should target that or not. But you put that into a computer, use a high-density mapping probe, and suddenly you have a picture, and you say, okay, you know what? I can detect this rotor, and maybe this is the area that needs to be targeted. Two of the catheters that we use, and I brought them just there. They're quite unique uh, formulations. We use is, is a basket catheter on your right, and this is how much information is being impossible for human eye to process its information, but fast computers can process this information into a form that we can then see. Um, I will go over a couple of cases which show, so here is a patient who had pulmonary vein isolation, procedure didn't work. We put this catheter into the heart um, and detected in the upper part of the atrium there's an area which was producing atrial fibrillation. So the veins are already electrically disconnected. Those are sort of the four horns you see. And the little area we saw on the body of the atrium was based on that mapping part of the problem, what was producing atrial fibrillation. And as we burned that area, 
the abnormal rhythm stopped and the normal rhythm was restored. And here is an example of the picture. It's, it's fascinating, so I just wanted to share it with you. Can you play it for me, please? So you can see the electricity going around. It, it would have been impossible to detect that without actually having that information from the entire atrium collected and then put into a computer system which could process it and then tell us. And this ended up about two to three millimeter zone, which in this particular patients were perpetuating the atrial fibrillation. So it actually doesn't, the initial, pers initial mapping takes at about 20 minutes for, to generate and collect all the data. This is one minute, and it is taken one minute and processed in another about 30 seconds. But then we repeatedly do it because the idea is reproducibility of what track this rotor is using. Because we don't ablate that one spot, we first figure out where is this tracking. And actually, we don't do it at one. We actually, I use two different ways to confirm that the both systems are actually telling us the same thing. Great question, and I didn't even ask you to ask me at this moment. <laughs> so in pulmonary vein isolation, generally speaking, we give everybody about three to four months to know whether it works or not. Because ablation is inflammation. Inflammation heals over time. So the lesion that were created on the day, I can tell you procedure went great, all veins are isolated. But actually that inflammation would translate into an electrical scar over next 12 to 16 weeks. So we do not go right away because you might just heal out of atrial fibrillation and may not need anything additional. If your atrial fibrillation continues beyond three to four months, that is the time to discuss whether now you're going to go back to medication and see if they work better. And sometimes those medication which didn't work before become very effective because the remaining substrate may be much more responsive to a drug which wasn't effective before. And at that point, you will make that decision. I generally do not bring patients back until about three to four months. However, with the exceptions would be if the second rhythm was an atrial fibrillation. If you began to have an atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter or some other circuit. Unfortunately, as a patient, you may not know because you felt palpitations before and you felt palpitations now. But EKG recording of the rhythm, or now a lot of you may already have a live core or Apple Watch, can help tell us whether or not this is true atrial fibrillation or some other circuit. What about cardia device? Cardia is exactly a live core. It is, very, it is a different name for that, yes. It can be useful. Now, again, it, it can help us know whether or not you're dealing with an organized rhythm or not. So this was just the limited picture of how much ablation was necessary for that patient. Um, so again, another example of that. Here's a gentleman who, 68-year-old, two drugs failed, never had ablation before, but left atrial volume, you will often hear the word left atrial volume or left atrial size, because that's almost like a vital sign for atrial fibrillation. Like, you go to your doctor for blood pressure, and he says, okay, what is your blood pressure over the last few weeks? Because that's going to determine how effective the therapy is. For an atrial fibrillation doctor, this is our vital sign. How big is your left atrium? Because if you have a very large left atrium, even if you're going in and out of AFib, you will very likely need more more than just pulmonary vein isolation. So in this patient, uh, the drugs didn't work, atrial fibrillation was continuous, and we found with this technique that the end, not only the veins, but the entire back wall of the atrium was causing atrial fibrillation. So using the cryo balloon, we not only ablated the veins, the red here shows now the electrical scar. This is the ablated zone. And as we did that, the patient went into normal rhythm. Another example of a patient who had multiple prior procedures, pulmonary veins, cafe, different institutions tried different approaches, and then he went from 2011 to 2008, 
2015, just up until June this year, without any arrhythmia, no drugs, and then it recurred again. And when we went back and took a look again, found out that the veins are all great, everything from previous ablation was good, but the little area on the back wall has now started to produce AFib. So we went back and we ablated that area, and interestingly, the, that area remained in AFib, but rest of the heart converted to normal rhythm. And since then, he has not been needed medications again. Before we go and open up, yes, go ahead, sir. Sorry, uh, I'd like you to bring me back to the very basic, I'm sorry. Uh, it seems to me, after listening to this, AFib is really a phenomenon indicating that some electrical signal in your heart is go haywire. Right. And then all you have been talking about is to how to isolate which area causing the problem. I, am I understand correctly so far? It, it, to some extent, that is correct. Okay. Yes, it it's depends so on... So you have not talked about how to heal. Uh, uh, my impression is once you find out the area is bad, causing the bad signal, and you, you somehow you do something to burn it and, and kill it to make sure those uh, crazy signal electrical signal won't come up again, is that the as, idea? As we talked about, if you have atrial fibrillation, your options include, we can put you on medication to control your heart rate. If you're happy with that, you can stop. Or you can use heart rhythm medication. And if they put you back in normal rhythm, you're happy with that, you can stop. If either those two strategies are unacceptable, or your atrial fibrillation does not respond to them, or the medications had side effects, then this is a more definitive way of treating your atrial fibrillation. This means you isolate the area and then do something with it, right? This is what call you this. Means. Ablations mean destroying abnormal circuits which are causing atrial fibrillation. Okay. Yep. Because the medication doesn't know the location of the crazy signal. That's why medication tend to be not very effective. So your expertise is to do isolation, right? At the area, right? My expertise is to be first to be your doctor, <laughs> figure out exactly what is your arrhythmia, how much it's affecting you, what's the health of your heart, what other factors you are. If, you have, <coughs> if you're too big, lose some weight. If you have sleep apnea, let's treat that. If you have high blood pressure, let's control it. And then, as a more definitive strategy, after you have implemented the lifestyle changes that you have, which majority of us will walk you through, then this is your option. Okay. All right. Let's briefly talk about. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned about ablation. So, how do you find out what caused it bef before you decide to do ablation? So, as we talked about, the cause of atrial fibrillation, by virtue of how the heart is built, we know that in 80% of the people is going to be a trigger coming out of the pulmonary veins. We already know that, but we confirm that before actually we treat those areas. And okay. how do you confirm that? By using a catheter, putting it into the vein, and confirming that it has abnormal trigger coming from it. Uh, so this is a question which you may often face. How do we decide that you need to be on blood thinner? This is a formula you can look up. We call it CHADS VASC. It's a number of different variables which we use. A number is calculated, and based on that number, we tell you whether or not you should be on blood thinner. Uh, when the risk for stroke um, exceeds the risk of serious bleeding from anticoagulation, uh, when the guidelines recommend that if this CHADS VASC score is two or more, you should be on a blood thinner. And Let's uh, talk about what's this, uh, I think let's, so why does atrial fibrillation cause stroke? So what happens is that if on a little sonogram that you see, it shows a clot in a part of the heart called left atrial appendage. So if you look at the left atrium, there's a little extension to it, which is called the appendage. It's both upper chambers have an appendage. On the right side, it doesn't have much implications because whatever forms there has to go through the lungs, and the lungs can process little clots without issue. On the left side, whatever breaks, if it potentially goes to your brain, it can form, cause a stroke. 
So fibrillation causes blood to stagnate in this structure called left atrial appendage, a little sort of dog ear hanging from the side of the left atrium. The stagnant blood becomes an ideal environment for a blood clot to form, and then the blood clot can dislodge from the left atrial appendage, travel through this arterial system, and if it hits your brain, that's when it causes a stroke. So when we use blood thinner, basically what they do is they thin the blood, and even though the atrial fibrillation is still there, the stagnant blood cannot form a clot. And these medications are very effective. How we determine that, that if you had heart failure, high blood pressure, if you're over 75 years of age, if you're diabetic, and if you had a previous stroke or a TIA, or if you're a woman, you get one or two points. And if these points aggregate is two or more, the doctor would recommend that you should be on a blood thinner. What about the watchman? Let's talk about that. <laughs> so the, <laughs> that is the next slide down. Oh. So warfarin is the most commonly used um, blood thinner, but it's tough to take. You have to be on a very strict diet. So if you sort of moved on from warfarin to what we call non-vitamin K dependent anticoagulants. If in the morning, in the evening, you will see those commercials, Eliquis, Pradaxa, um, and Xarelto. And those are the ones who have similar efficacy to warfarin. They were all tried against warfarin in good 20,000 patients each trial. And they're effective and better tolerated and uh, are, provide similar or better efficacy than warfarin. And if for some reason you cannot take warfarin or you cannot take long-term blood thinner, one option is what you asked, Watchman. So Watchman is a device which is implanted into the left atrial appendage so that it's excluded from the circulation. So the blood can no longer get into it. And if it can't get in, it can form a clot. And hence, it. so it was trialed in comparison to warfarin or Coumadin, and they uh, found that its efficacy is very similar to warfarin, but it reduces the risk of bleeding because, of course, you're not, no longer on blood thinner. So how this is performed is that uh, is, again, through the venous system. A small puncture is made in the vein in your groin. The catheter is sent into the heart. It's deployed into the left atrial appendage. You're on a blood thinner for about 45 days or so, and beyond that, you're retested with the TEE to confirm that the appendage is no longer part of the circulation, and then you can come off blood thinner and just stay with daily aspirin. You would not have to take blood thinner again, regardless of whether you have atrial fibrillation or not. Um, I think one of my other partners at, at some point a few weeks ago talked about it in more detail. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure. So Watchman does not change what happens to your atrial fibrillation. What it changes is that it reduces your stroke risk without exposing you to lifelong blood thinner. With that, I'm going to stop and take whatever questions you may have. Okay, go ahead. Is there a difference between AFib in your left and right atrium? No. There is a difference from the standpoint of if we were using ablation strategy and we found that left atrium was no longer playing major part in it. But that can only be determined during an ablation procedure. But there's no difference how you, majority of atrial fibrillation, I would say 75% of it comes from the left atrium. So comes from the right. Left atrium. Oh, okay. So you're, you're, you're... It's not as bad then because it's not on the left? No, it's equally bad. <laughs> it's... <laughs> that's what Unfortunately. <laughs> that's what I wanted to find out. Okay, yes, you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, you talked about 70 or 80% success rate for uh, the peroxyl, which I guess the periodic, episodic that's uh, correct. Of, of AFib. I've got permanent AFibs that stuck. What are the numbers in that situation? Is there any change of procedure? Right. So, of course, that would mean that in your case, pulmonary vein isolation's efficacy would be less than 50%. If you combine pulmonary vein isolation with other 
ablation, which would be targeted based on the newer mapping techniques, then at least my current data is that about 78% with medication and 70% without medication. But again, there's a number of variables. What's your left atrial size? What's the electrical health of your, I mean, it's, it's if I'll we. I'll be seeing you shortly. So okay. okay. <laughs> I'm scheduled for it with, okay. with, with you. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not you're going to test for electrical signals first or just go ahead and do it and, and then... We always do. It's part of the... If your vein was electrically quiet to begin with, we would not ablate it. So it's always... The same catheter has the ability... The catheter that assesses the vein is actually connected to the one that delivers the cryoenergy. So it will be tested. It's Correct. a possibility I won't have the pulmonary vein isolation. If you have AFib, the likelihood that you would not have active pulmonary vein potentials is less than 10%. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What is the main sign that you being on medication that you know that you may need, um, I, a, uh, I a forgot the name. Procedure, ablation. Ablation, uh-huh. What, what is it, you know, your numbers are good and everything, so what would be the biggest sign that would tell you that you need ablation? I mean, I think it's, you have to sort of make that decision in confidence with your electrophysiologist, but I think the idea would be if your medications are effective, you feel well, the heart structure doesn't change, you know, you get an echo every year, your arrhythmia is not progressing, you're fine with medication. If, on the other hand, there's a progression, you're needing higher dose of medication, then it means that there may be an uptick in the triggers and they're able to get breakthrough. And then you want to consider either a different medication or a procedure. Yes, ma'am. Of um, controlling the heart rate in terms to treat um, AFib, and in terms of um, the heart rate, does having a regular rate versus high rate also affect the prognosis of um, AFib? And does um, controlling the heart rate um, get your rhythm back to normal? So your rate can be controlled by two ways, by either leaving you in atrial fibrillation but putting you on a lot of medication which slow your heart rate down. So your heart rate is still irregular, but it's slower. That is, it is very important to slow the heart rate down because there is a, there is a progression of the disease or there's a, something called tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy. What it means basically is that if we leave your heart rate fast, let's say above 110 beats per minute consistently, your heart muscle will weaken and eventually you'll get into heart failure. So it's important to control the rate. Now, um, if you have a regular rate, it's, it's really the number is important as long as it's consistently averaging below 100, you're okay. But it's very individual. If you are left in rate control, your doctor will often get Holter monitors randomly just to make sure that even though you don't feel bad, your heart rate's not poorly controlled. So, the, um, you know, so for the proxismal um, AFib, taking the heart rate control medicine doesn't really, it's not really doing, affecting to get you back into normal rhythm. It's just lowering the heart rate. Is that right? Generally speaking, that is correct. It is very rare for metoprolol or diltiazem to commonly use drug to effectively convert you back to normal rhythm. You convert on your own. What they do is that they don't allow your heart rate to go too fast during the procedure. Okay. All right. Yes. I have an apology, a comment, and a question. Yes. Apology is I'm sorry I'm late because I didn't know it had gotten moved to this room. So the comment is your slides are good, but from this back here, they're an eye test. <laughs> so Hi. are you going to make, uh, are you going to provide the uh, copies of the slides for, and okay, my question we'll, we'll, is, thank my, you my for, question, we'll work on it next time, make it more, well, more uh, better for farther out, yes. My question is, uh, does AFib ever go away completely? No. It so generally, I'm, st no, I'm it, stuck with it for the rest of my life. And it, and if that's the case, because my heart is beating faster, is it wearing out by uh, 
the excess uh, BD? Uh, so again, it was very similar to what she asked. Yes, unfortunately, AFib doesn't go away. It's a progressive disease and it tends to kind of stay with you. It can progress adversely, but it's, unless it's treated or something is done, it's not likely to go back to a normal rhythm. Now, the veering out of the heart is not based on that it's running consistently fast. As long as one or the other measures is being used to monitor your heart rate on regular basis, plus your heart muscle function on a regular basis. Because even in some people where the heart rate is quote-unquote controlled, they can get a cardiomyopathy or weakened heart muscle. So you just need closer monitoring. And after you know, a year or two years or whatever the duration may be, it, may, it would sort of become clear whether or not in your case treatment by controlling your heart rate is adequate or not. surgery, how would you, uh, how often or how quickly can you do that? Can oh, you so the, activities? right, so the ablation procedure from the, the day it's done, you have a bed rest and you generally stay in the hospital overnight, you're home next day. We say no heavy lifting exercise or swimming for five days and that's primarily not for your heart but for the groin. And after five days, you can resume your normal activity including exercise, swimming, everything else. Do you have any helpful hints if you feel like you're having an episode in order to get everything going back to regular sinus rhythm? <laughs> there are, but you've got to discuss it with your doctor because there are many, there are strategies called pill out of pocket in which we tell you take this pill and that would work to restore you to back to normal rhythm. And in, in most, in a lot of people, it's very effective. But the first time we implement it, we have you go to the emergency room so we can implement it and tell you that it works fine. Because one of the concerns with this as needed strategy is that you may come out of AFib to a very slow heart rhythm. Let's say you took the pill you were driving and for a moment, you, you sort of lost where you were, that would not be good. So we have to institute it first time around in a monitored setting, and then it might be a strategy you can use. Yes? So after the, my ablation, my blood pressure has been is down to where I don't take any, hype, any medication any longer. If I do, it's really down to where I get dizzy and I damn it faint. Is that common? It's not, but there is some degree of what we call... Um, nerve modulation that happens because the upper chambers are directly supplied by some of the nerves, vagus nerve. And those ganglia can be affected, but it's usually not a long, I mean, you got two out of one, but yeah. it's generally speaking not directly related to each other. There's no physiologic reason. And even if the ganglion are somewhat modified, which we expect it to, they're generally back within six to seven weeks, so, yes. Yes, ma'am. What about natural blood thinners through food and vitamins? How would you speak to that? So the problem is that whenever we talk about something which hasn't been tested, it becomes conjecture, and those have not been tested. So we felt aspirin would work. An antiplatelet agent works wonders for coronary artery disease, and when we tested, they had to stop the trial because warfarin was so much more effective than aspirin in preventing stroke. So whenever these things are not tested, their validity of their efficacy is very questionable, and I would not rely on them at all. The stroke is we are very good at preventing it. It is an impossible disease to treat. You have to be in a certain place at the right time. You have to be a candidate for TPA and whatnot. And uh, uh, atrial fibrillation and stroke go hand in hand. And if one thing you leave with is that if you have AFib and you're at high risk of stroke, the life-saving intervention is not an ablation, it's the blood thinner. Or the laxative. Or the alternative, correct. Yes? Is there a number or a, a limit to the number of cardioversions you have? And uh, if you have uh, are in AFib, is there a, a, a length of time that uh, is uh, 
uh, makes it more difficult to treat. So if you're in persistent AFib for a longer time, and the longer it is, the harder it is to treat, or does Correct. it make sense I to do a so uh, cardioversion to? So cardioversion by itself, the number doesn't really mean a whole lot, other than that if you had a cardioversion and two weeks later you're back in AFib and you had another one, at some point it becomes sort of a most stupid idea. I mean, it's not working. And beyond that, the cardioversion by itself, if you go out of AFib once a year and get cardioverted, that's fine. Every six months even, some, some, there, there was a time when uh, not before the ablation technology really came this way, there's really not a whole lot of option in people who were very symptomatic. They would have a defibrillator implanted and they would shock themselves and get out of the rhythm because it was infrequent enough. But persistent atrial fibrillation, longer it is, the harder it becomes to treat. The numbers currently is that if you have an AFib persistently ongoing for five years or more, the procedures are not going to work. Between two to five years, the efficacy is less, but it still works. Under two years, it works quite well, even if you hadn't been treated for two years. Yes, ma'am. So as we talked about, depending on the nature of your arrhythmia, whether you have proxismal persistent or healthy heart or not, the success rate based on your profile would be 60 to 80 percent. 80 percent if you have a normal heart and true proxismal AFib, less if it's not. The rest of the procedure is somewhere around 1 to 2 percent, and they include uh, cardiac perforation, TIA stroke, damage to the phrenic nerve or esophagus. Most of them are extremely rare. I would say our data here is about 1 percent. 99% of the time, you should safely get through the procedure without any uh, complications. Dr. Rashid, we have a few questions from our digital audience. Yes. The first is, what are the long-term effects of AFib if you treat only for stroke control? So longer you stay in atrial fibrillation, um, it's, it would become less and less likely that normal rhythm can be restored. Um, the implications are again deliver, uh, d driven by your symptoms. And I think the most critical part of if you have atrial fibrillation is to make a good decision in confidence with your treating cardiologist that why you choose rate control, meaning that you elected to stay on blood thinners and in atrial fibrillation, because that choice has long-term implications. If you go five years, then the procedures and none of them work. However, if you, you know, are at that point in your age where atrial fibrillation is not limiting you a whole lot and the rate control is very effective, you could stay with it because the, there is no mortality benefit reported with antirhythmic drugs or ablation so far, even though I would say the trials are limited with ablation. So I have a question on Facebook Live. Um, she asks, I have a, I've had a stroke and been told I am in persistent atrial fib. I also have a PFO. Is pulmonary vein isolation an option for me? It uh, certainly is. And um, you know, you need to sort of disc the duration of AFib, drug failures, left atrial size, a number of things are going. PFO does not limit the ablation option. If it, anything, it could potentially facilitate it because the hole already exists in going across to the left side. And uh, the stroke itself, it, it does not increase your risk from the ablation procedure. Yes. If the fapanol stopped working at, uh, before your ablation, now you have your ablation, does, will it work after that? Or is it yeah, as, we, as I said earlier, the medication that were ineffective before often become effective after a procedure. So, yeah, it often happens that those that didn't work. However, the caveat with propafenone and flecainide is that they end up facilitating flutter-like circuits, which means that if you never had a flutter ablation and now you're taking those, you may get into a different rhythm issue. <laughs> yes, I think there was a question in the back. Uh, yes, this may not have anything to do with, with modern medicine, but back in the 50s when I was uh, experimenting a lot with electrical stuff, one of the cautions was don't 
be, be sure you don't get electrical shock because it will cause it might cause AF. And for a long time, you never heard about AF until just recently, in the last five or ten years. Is there a reason for that, or? No, actually, atrial fibrillation goes back. If you look at the, you know, the, the Greek physicians, they noted they cardiac glycosides people used to chew on what eventually became the Jackson because it controlled the heart rate. There is, uh, I think, there is one uh, sort of description of people being told to sleep on their right side because they felt less palpitation. And you can understand on the left side, your heart sitting on your chest. And it, your hand and the bones are all connected, so you're feeling more of your heartbeat. On the right side, the heart falls onto the liver like a big cushion. You can't hear it. So people slept better. So I think going back, atrial fibrillation was probably common all along, but it is not one of those sort of life-threatening arrhythmias. Most people can sort of manage themselves. So, you know, chewing on the glycosides worked for a long time. Question about the medication amiodarone. Um, is that something that you need to be aware of testing if you're on it, or is it something you should try to get off of? Or yes, if you are taking amiodarone, you should try to get off it. It's a medication which has, which is very effective life-saving drug, but not the best drug for AFib unless everything else has failed. The reason being, the drug has one to three percent potential organ toxicity. It can affect your liver, lungs, thyroid, and eyes. All of those need to be monitored closely at six months to a one-year intervals. So if you have an atrial fibrillation which can be treated by a different drug, that would be much better. Yeah. I have another question from Facebook Live. Um, if ablations don't work, would you try the maze procedure? Um, it would, I, I would say that in, in high-end expert institutions, we can kind of reproduce maze procedure with catheter ablation. But if catheter ablation did not work and you had extensive ablations before, maize may not work either. So you're going to have, there are probably a handful of expert centers nationally. Probably Washu Barnes is one of them, where really there are surgeons who are dedicated to atrial fibrillation maize procedure. The other maize procedures I, I would recommend against. Um, and again, it depends the nature of, uh, we didn't talk about that, but to briefly say that in, in, in some patients, let's say, the drugs didn't work, the rate control didn't work, the ablation didn't work, and let's throw in maize too. Maize didn't work. Your heart rate's still fast. There is a procedure called pacemaker and AV node ablation. It's sort of a last resort procedure in which you put in a pacemaker and then you kill the normal conduction system of the heart and make the patient dependent on a pacemaker. That is a solution. We used to do that when the other ablations were unavailable. It controls your heart rate, but then it makes you dependent on a pacemaker, and there are implications to that. So we tend to avoid that procedure very much now, unless you're sort of at the close you know, end of your life, and there's no reason to worry too much about that. Otherwise, we avoid it. But that is certainly an option in certain patients. Uh, I think there was a question here, yeah. Is there an age in which um, AFib becomes more prevalent, or is it that we've all had it, we just never noticed it, and for some reason now, I don't know? No, it is age-related. As you cross the age of 60, every five years, it almost doubles in risk. So even if, and so there's often somebody would ask you a question, I had a pulmonary vein isolation, do you think I would not have AFib? And we don't know the answer to that because the other areas may take over because there is sort of a, a degenerative electrical changes that occur in the heart as it occurs in the rest of the body. And that is one of the reasons why atrial fibrillation occurs. And it's not always trigger-based from the pulmonary vein. So if at 60 there is a certain risk, that increase about one and a half fold by 65. By, by 85, you have about 15 percent risk of AFib. Is it generally genetic? Like if you have like grandparents, the parents that also had strokes, probably due to AFib, that was never diagnosed, is that? No, once you cross the age of 65, the genetics have less and less role. It's more of a age-related phenomenon.
It varies. I think you, you know, my patients often ask me, and I said, check it out, see if it triggers anymore or not. It shouldn't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Doctor, I'd like to ask you, uh, I'm taking metobolol. Is it the right medicine? That, again, you know, I can't, I, it's hard for me to give you an individual advice without really knowing your profile. So that would be the best answered by your cardiologist. Thank but you. It may be, but I think that's, that's uh, needed to be in context of other things. So are you a cardiologist or are you I'm, is an agent Surgeon. doctor? I think I'm, so I have become an AFib doctor, but I was, so all of us trained in cardiology. So we have four years of training in that. Then we do two years of electrophysiology, so specifically training in heart rhythm. And then within the world of heart rhythm, I'm part of Virginia Heart, there are six of us who do electrophysiology. There, I know it has other, so I have sort of become a specialist within the realm of AFib because it's the most common arrhythmia and there's, tons of people who need different help. So, yeah, you know, I was a cardiologist at one point. <laughs> uh, it's a very short one. Uh, stroke is related to your brain, right? And AFib is related to your heart. But why, but why is that these two things that have a very strong correlation? It's very simple. The clot forms in the heart and it ends up in your brain. Huh? The clot oh, forms the in your heart and then it ends up in your brain. And when the clot goes to your brain, Stroke happens. Oh, so stroke is due to the clot. Correct. Yes. Ultimately, a pacemaker will be the final answer or the, the best? No, actually, this is very deceptive. Pacemaker does not treat AFib. Pacemaker knows only one thing to do. It won't let your heart rate go down below the number that we program it. Above that heart rate, you're on your own and that's your AFib. So pacemaker is not the treatment. Your doctor may choose to put in a pacemaker because when you are in normal rhythm, your heart rate's too slow. But the pacemaker does not treat AFib, it cannot do anything with it, and it is not the treatment for arrhythmia. It is a backup measure to make sure your heart rate goes, doesn't go too slow. Thank you. You're welcome. How long is an ablation procedure? So I would say pulmonary vein isolation, if that's all it's done, it's about 90 minutes. The other ablations where you have to repeatedly go in and test and retest can take up to four hours. I have one more question on Facebook Live. Yes. <clears throat> My husband has had two ablations. The first lasted for five years. The second lasted only one year. He is currently controlling it with medication what would be your recommendation if he goes back into AFib? So uh, it is, uh, the question is that whether or not the recurrence was true AFib or it was some sort of a flutter or an atrial tack because that will end up dictating. I would say if the medication is working, stay with it. If the medication doesn't work, then the nature of the recurrence would dictate the right treatment. You could choose a different medication or have a more targeted procedure for the recurrence because my suspicion is the recurrence is not true AFib. It's some other circuit which may not involve the entire atrium but may involve one or two regions of the two upper chambers. You said that... You said 90 minutes for pulmonary vein isolation. What if that is combined with uh, uh, atrial flutter ablation? Is you add another time? 20 minutes or so. And again, th this is the going into the lab. We call it EP lab. Going into the lab takes about half an hour to set up. And then after we're done, another half an hour to kind of get you out back to your room. So sort of there is some dead time involved in the duration. So for your spouse or another, you know, loved one who is waiting out there, it may seem a little longer, but the procedure itself doesn't take that entire duration. Is it safe to, um, not to take any medication, you have a atrial fibrillation, you don't take any medication until you get the symptoms. Is that safe? Because I know somebody, <laughs> 
who does just that? Well, <laughs> it, <laughs> it depends. You know, if, they're, if they go into AFib and their heart rate's controlled, then may, they may not. But if they go into AFib and the heart rate's not controlled, then they will have the similar implications. So uh, <laughs> probably it's uh, not the best way to go about things, but, you know, he may or... Again, you know, your doctor can give you the best advice because, yes, there are scenarios which the AFib has no symptom, it, the heart's not racing, but it's relatively infrequent that that would be the case. Yeah, I think it's very helpful, particularly if you're going in and out. It can actually help is because, you know, uh, if you go see your doctor on that day, you're in normal rhythm, and you come a year later, you're again, and you say, you know, I had miserable December, how would we know? So keeping an Apple Watch might allow you to bring that data in, and then we can see how much recurrences is. Because AFib is kind of very seasonal. It's, there are periods when you are sort of going in and out, in and out, and then it kind of goes into a lull, and then it occurs again. But general trajectory is that overall the frequency would increase. Could you have AFib for, let's say, years, five years, six years, and you didn't know it? And, uh, and then maybe in the fifth or sixth year, all of a sudden you're having some events, you, you, you know there's something wrong. Correct. It can happen. Uh, there are people who first time find out and you can't even know how long they were in it. But for it's, it's a rather exception than the rule. Yes? Can you, can you tell if your um, heart rate is fast or slow? Because the rhythm is irregular, right? Yeah, so it becomes difficult if you're taking your pulse or a pulse ox or something. The only true way to record it, like she asked, there's these Apple watches and whatnot. They're more sensitive to the true rate. Because if you're taking pulse, the problem with AFib is that we call something pulses deficit. Your heart may be going 140 here, but if you measure pulse, because at time there's missed pulse because the heart wasn't full of blood, because all you're feeling is the pumped blood, and that number is actually much lower than the true heart rate. So there's a machine that, like you said, Apple Watch does that? Apple Watch, Cardia, Alive Core, they're sort of all th same things. This company affiliated with Apple to produce these <coughs> products. Is there any indication that taking like zinc and potassium, magnesium, and all of those types of things can help with your heart rhythm? Or, or has there ever been so uh, none of, that? of those supplements, unless you had a proven deficiency, would help. So uh, magnesium is often one which is uh, frequently the other things are supplemented. If you're eating regular food, there's enough around. Magnesium may be one exception, but you have to sort of, because you don't want to, randomly, honestly, I'll tell you, these supplements do not decrease your risk of having AFib. Actually, there's nobody knows. They may even increase the risk. So I would not take supplement hoping that they would work better for your arrhythmia. So, you're, so if I use a cardia, I'm in AFib four or five days a week, out one, two days a week. Been going on now for three years. Do you recommend a uh, procedure? Again, it depends. I mean, you've been going in it for many years now, and it uh, sounds like you have uh, uh, sort of, if your heart's mechanically normal, these rhythms are not limiting you, and you feel okay, you might want to continue with this. But again, you should have an echo, your left atrial, right atrial sizes should be measured, and all those things taken be into account with sort of what if you progress to permanent, what if, what if this pattern goes away. So there are a number of variables, but yes, you could. Yes. You, you mentioned uh, three alternative drugs over uh, warfarin. Have they been around long enough that there are generic versions of them? Unfortunately not. That remains the Achilles heels. The moment they are going to become generic, you're not going to see a commercial. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the price will go down and nobody will be interested in <laughs> putting them on the news anymore. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're so very much welcome. For Absolutely. Your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Rashid, I have another question from our webinar audience. 
What are the options? And I think you did cover this in good detail, but uh, let's just go over it once more. What are the options if you are in permanent AFib and have coronary artery disease? So uh, there are some limitation in antiarrhythmic drug choices, but there are a couple of drugs that can be used. Uh, perhaps the most effective are going to be either a drug called doferilide or tikicin or amiodarone. And probably doferilide is preferred because it has no long-term side effect, but the downside is it needs to be instituted in an inpatient setting where you're in the hospital for three days. But unless there's an absolute contraindication, that would be something they should discuss with their doctor, instituting deferilide for a control of their AFib. Yes? What precautions have AFib should, should you take before you go into for an operation, anesthesia or something? If you're, if you're uh, again, if your heart rate's controlled, you're taking your medication, um, you should probably continue with beta blockers and that type of medication. Uh, uh, if you're going through an operation, unfortunately, you'll probably have to come off your blood thinner, which increases your risk of stroke a little bit during and perioperatively, but not high enough to warrant that you be on supplemental blood thinners. So for most of our patients, depending on the nature of their surgery, you have to sort of talk to their surgeon to what they feel their bleeding risk is, and probably just get them off and get them back on to the blood thinner that they usually take. So what would be better, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers? Again, it depends on your tolerance. Some people feel very fatigued with one drug, and the other may work out better for them. So it's more of what works better with your system. They are both reasonably equally effective. My personal preference is beta blocker unless you have a fatigue. Yes. 